Hello and welcome to another edition of Weapons and Warfare from Straight Arrow News. I'm Ryan Robertson and we are coming to you from the floor of the 2024 Air and Space Forces Association's Warfare Symposium in Aurora, Colorado. This is where leadership from the Air and Space Forces gather to share ideas and outline their plans for the future of their respective branches. It's also where scores of civilian companies come to display their latest innovations and develop partnerships with potential buyers. Just ahead in our debrief, a look at how Congress's continuing resolution is slowing plans for changes military leaders say are needed for their forces to be ready for ever-changing threats from America's adversaries. And we visit with the folks at Shield AI for our weapon of the week. From AI pilots to the VBAT drone, they're breaking new ground with a UAV that could be another game changer. Plus, a correction from me in our comms check this week on a story that we had done about uh, airplanes flying into the Middle East. But first, as we always do, let's get started with some headlines. A mechanical failure is likely the cause of a deadly crash that claimed the lives of eight Air Force Special Operations troops on November 29th of last year. That word coming from the Pentagon as the investigation into the crash of the CV-22 Osprey off the southern coast of Japan continues. In early December, the Air Force grounded its fleet of Osprey aircraft. The commander of Air Force Special Operations told reporters at the symposium this year that he will not send airmen back up in the V-22 until he's sure every question has been answered. Nothing is more important to me than the safety of our air commandos. And when the time is right, when we make that decision to return to fly, it will be with me having the full confidence, not only in our training, but our crews, as well as the platform and any mitigation measures that we have in place to ensure that we can react appropriately if another situation develops. The November crash is the fourth for the Osprey program since March of 2022. When it comes to Russia and its ability to conduct war, it's worse than we thought. That, according to a report from Bloomberg, is the sentiment among NATO leadership. Be it artillery shells or soldiers on the ground, Russia is replenishing its war efforts at a rate many in NATO did not think was possible. Just last month, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg said the war in Ukraine is now a battle for ammunition. President Biden and the Senate recently pushed forward an aid package worth more than $90 billion, the bulk of which went to Ukraine and Israel. The bill died in the House, though, as Speaker Mike Johnson said, he needs to see legislation to address the U.S. southern border first. And as the Houthi missile attacks on ships in the Red Sea continue, so do America's efforts to mitigate those attacks. One standout of note comes from the U.S. Marine Corps. First reported by Alert 5, Captain Earl Earhart V could be America's first fighter ace since the Vietnam War. At the time of this recording, Captain Earhart is credited with shooting down seven Houthi drones. The Harrier pilot is flying off the amphibious assault ship USS Bataan. And his jet was reconfigured for these very specific air defense missions. The captain told the BBC that means his Harrier was in beast mode, carrying all the missiles it could fit under its wings. Good hunting, Captain. If this year's gathering had a one-word description, it would be change. If it had a three-word description, it would be change on Holt. In the symposium's opening event, leaders from the Air and Space Forces laid out their plans for preparing their troops for constantly evolving threats from several corners of the world. Unfortunately, in their view, there's one major obstacle preventing the change from happening. Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. We are out of time. We are out of time. Because for at least two decades, China has been building a military that is designed purpose-built to deter and defeat the United States if we intervene in the Western Pacific. From the very start of this year's AFA Warfare Symposium, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall made it clear the U.S. cannot afford to put off military modernization any longer. The United States does not seek a conflict. We have every hope that one can be avoided. We are, however, involved in a competition, an enduring competition that could turn into a conflict at any time. We can no longer regard conflict as a distant possibility or a future problem that we might have to confront. The risk of conflict is here now 
and that risk will increase with time. When Secretary Kendall came into office in 2021, he hit the ground running, outlining what he called operational imperatives, factors that would shape how the Air and Space Forces would invest the money from Congress to make sure both branches are ready for a great power competition with China. That work had a major impact on the FY24 budget that was submitted a year ago. We're still, by the way, waiting for the Congress to appropriate the FY24 funds that we need now to modernize the Air and Space Forces and to defend the nation. Congress, if you're listening, an FY24 appropriation would be very welcome. And once again, please do not subject us to a disastrous year-long CR and sequestration. On a personal note, it would be very disappointing to me to have been in office for an entire administration and have never received any of the needed resources to be competitive. Resources that we identified in the first six months I was in office. Under a continuing resolution, service branches are forced to operate at the same spending levels as the previous fiscal year. It also means virtually no new spending, so no new projects can start, no new trainings can begin, no much-needed modernization efforts. With any sort of continuing resolution, it's that uncertainty of funding as it goes forward. In some cases, with new starts, we fundamentally can't even start the work we need to do. And so without that monetary aspect in place, we're, we're, we're sitting on our hands and we're not moving forward. Even with continuing resolution, the second aspect, though, is, is the are we going to overspend what we expect to get? So people tend to become more conservative, thereby pulling their punches a little bit in the execution of those resources. And both of those get solved with, a, um, with Congress's guidance in the form of a budget. All right, for our weapon of the week this week, we are talking about the Kratos fire jet, which is flown by Shield AI's Hive Mind autopilot. So I'm gonna bring in Shield AI's president CEO, Brandon Singh, to talk about this. Brandon, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So this, you were telling me this, it's, it's for targeting and red flag, what is that? What is all that? Yeah, so our partnership with Kratos is really about productizing and bringing to market AI pilots. So Shield AI, we are building the world's best AI pilot uh, to retake the skies. What is an AI pilot? Essentially, it is self-driving technology for aviation. And why is that important? It enables aircraft to operate without GPS, without communications, without remote pilot. Uh, it enables the concept of swarming or teaming. Um, and then just like self-driving cars can learn to drive different missions, park, you know, do on-ramp to off-ramp, do freeway driving, suburban driving. You can train aircraft to do different missions as well. We train quadcopters to clear buildings. Uh, we trained an F-16 to dogfight. Uh, we are working on suppression of enemy air defense missions, maritime domain awareness missions. And so really you can train these aircraft to learn and operate just at any mission that you, you can define that any human pilot flies today. You bet, you bet. So what you're saying is hive mind is not limited to one type of craft. It can teach it to fly any craft. Yes, you can teach it to fly any craft. And so the MQM-178 fire jet, and Kratos has been a terrific partner with us, um, it actually represents the sixth class of aircraft that we have flown. So we've flown three different, Hive Mind has flown three quadcopters, it's flown our VBAT, it's flown the F-16, and the MQM-178 is the sixth aircraft, and later this year when we fly the Valkyrie, that'll be the seventh aircraft. And so, uh, Shield AI, essentially what we're doing is taking our AI pilot and integrating it on lots and lots of different aircraft. So you can imagine a world where there are hundreds of thousands of aircraft, up to a million aircraft flying. We don't have enough pilots. What's flying those? AI pilots. Hivemind will be flying those. How did you come up with the name Hivemind? Uh, Hive, yeah, great question. Actually, it's, uh, it's you know, a, uh, a science fiction um, reference. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but, you know, I, I, I used to play uh, StarCraft uh, when I was a kid, and Hive Mind is like, you know, I think it's one of the, the characters in the game of StarCraft, which is a real-time, you know, science fiction type uh, 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 strategy game, and so I got a little inspiration there. You bet. You bet. Brandon, that was great. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us today. Folks, you're definitely going to want to keep an eye on Hive Mind because where this thing is going, I mean, sky's the limit, space is the limit. What do you think? Uh, I'll, I'll just say it's it's going everywhere. I, I you know when I started the company in 2015, asked myself what uh, 
you know, what's the military look like of 2035? Decided AI and autonomy should be commanding, maneuvering, piloting all of our different assets. And so we think about Hivemind being that key enabler uh, for the U.S. military and to enable the concept of intelligent, affordable mass. That sounds great. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks. All right, folks, it's time for Comps Check this week. I don't have my fancy touch screen behind me, but that's okay. We're going to get through this. It's going to be a quick one. Uh, so we had done a story about the silver lining to some of the Houthi Red Sea attacks. Essentially, that U.S. and U.K. Uh, Navy personnel were getting a chance to defend the ships and get some real-world experience. Uh, Beardy McBeardface said it was a great piece, thanked, uh, thanked us for finally having some facts and nothing else in the story, so you're welcome, Beardy McBeardface. But Paul Wood said the Navy doesn't have any F-15 carrier squadrons, because in the story I said that the Eisenhower was launching F-35s and F-15s. Well, you know what, Paul? You're right. The Navy doesn't have any F-15 fighter squadrons. That was my mistake. What they did launch was F-35s and F-A-18 Super Hornets. So, Paul, thank you for uh, correcting my mistake. And for everyone else out there, this is proof that when we make a mistake at Weapons and Warfare, we own up to it. That's how you can trust us. But in the meantime, that's Comps Check. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. Well, everyone, we are just about done with this week's episode of Weapons and Warfare. But before we go, I want to wrap up the show talking about something that we mentioned in the debrief, Congress's continuing resolution to fund the government. Now, like we said before, under a CR, unless a special exception is made, every service branch is forced to operate at a level on par with the previous fiscal year's budget, which doesn't take into account things like inflation or the rising cost of material goods or any other factor which may make things cost more than what a CR would fund. We told you what this means for programs or weapon systems, but operating without an approved congressional budget also hurts the Department of Defense's most valuable resource, its people. I spoke with an Air Force officer here at the symposium who told me when the DOD doesn't have a budget and doesn't know when the next will be approved, everything tightens up and decisions no officer wants to make are made. Sometimes that means fewer training missions. Sometimes that means less career development. But sometimes that means people lose their jobs, and not necessarily in the military, but in the private sector too. Under a CR, since no new programs can start, some contracts go unfulfilled, which means there's no money to pay the workers who are supposed to be doing the work. And of course, there's a psychological toll as well. Put yourself in the shoes of a service member. You volunteer to sign up. You're told you'll play an integral role in defending the nation and preserving freedom. But when it comes time to cut the checks instead of giving their best, like they ask of you, Congress tells you to put a cap on it. Yes, your mission is important and may literally mean the difference between life and death, but we don't feel like doing the work to get you what you need, so make do with what you got. The country may be divided and Congress may be broken, but funding our national defense and our troops should not be a divisive issue. Whether it be from near peer adversaries or militant extremists, providing protection is not cheap. And as we've all heard, freedom isn't free. Part of the problem, in my estimation, is the lack of military experience on Capitol Hill right now. After World War II, 85% of Congress had military experience. Today, that number is closer to just 15%. And while I appreciate the separation between Congress and our military, I have to imagine if more members of Congress reported to office with military service on their resume, then giving the best that we have to offer what they need to stay in the fight wouldn't be such a fight. But that's my thoughts. What are yours? Let us know by commenting on our social media feeds or sending us an email to weaponsandwarfare at san.com. For senior producer Brett Baker, for video editor Brian Spencer, and for graphic designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off.